Making department in 2010, and I'm here to take you on a tour of the Nature Lab. With me today is Jen Bissonette, who's the interim director of the Edmund Lawrence Nature Lab, and I'm going to pass it over to Jen. Hi, everybody, and welcome to 13 Waterman Street, which is the original building um, that housed all of RISD back when it started in 1877. Now, this is the purview of the freshmen and all the freshmen studios. So, up above us will be all the studio space. Over here, we have the Experimental and Foundation Studies Division Office. So, and you can see there's a lot of freshmen and freshman faculty coming through at this time. It's studio switch over time. So we're in the gallery space, which often has shows up for freshman studies and other departments around the, um, around the campus. But for right now, we're going to introduce you to the Nature Lab. So this space, this iconic space, and for those of you that are alum, you'll remember it, and maybe it's changed just a little since you were last here. This space, when it was just RISD in here, just this was all of RISD, this was the gallery space. So if you can imagine what the um, museum looks like now and the expansive galleries we have there, this used to be it in terms of space that we had for holding the whole collection. Um, over time, it's transmuted into our library, so you can still see that uh, kind of turn of the last century cabinets that would have been filled with books and protected by these glass doors. Um, and then we had a remarkable alumni, somebody who graduated in 1920, came back here to teach in 1937, who started the collection that we see today, so over 80 years ago. And I'm going to introduce you to our operations coordinator, Betsy Rupa, who's going to talk to you a little bit about the history of the lab, what kind of work goes on in here, and the collection itself. Yes, that is what I'm going to do. Um, hi there, welcome to the Nature Lab. This is my domain. Uh, this is the original part of the Nature Lab. This is where everything started. Miss Lawrence used to travel around the world and collect specimens wherever she went. One time she was even a stowaway on a ship and she ran around the world, brought things back before customs got uptight and she could bring things back for students to look at. And her belief, which we actually still believe in, was that students would benefit from looking at nature, that students can find information and do research and inspiration from color, form, pattern, texture, structure, you name it, uh, that she really believed that you should interact with it. She also believed that you should interact with it uh, in person, which meant that you could, um, and we'll talk about normal conditions, not pandemic conditions, that students can come and open this cabinet, for example, and grab something that interests them and take it out and actually study it. So it's unmediated uh, in the sense that they can come and do whatever they want to do here. They can um, sit down at these tables, which are normally in a different configuration. We can fit about 35 people in here generally, and they can draw, they can use any media, media that they want except oil paint. She, um, she felt that, uh, well, in her drawings, actually, the student drawings that she did, they're almost like scientific illustration. However, things have changed a little bit now, and so people aren't necessarily doing that kind of intense, um, intense rote drawing. Although, a lot of people do come in here and do that. Students from all departments come in here, generally, um, especially freshmen right now. Freshmen are about a third of our business, as they say. And then we have CE, which is continuing education people, about a third of them use this space. And finally, um, the rest of the RISD community comes in here and uses it. So it's used, I like to think that it's used in as many ways as there are students. Everybody's individual, everybody's different, everybody's need or interest is different. We classify things in a semi-scientific way. It's sort of subtle. And on the, this wall over here that you're looking at, this is the plant section. So everything on this side would be plant related or something that grows in the ground. And on the wall where I was just pointing out where the bird was, that's all the animals. We have a back wall full of insects and arachnids way back over there. We also generally have live animals here, which 
um, Miss Lawrence also did. She used to bring in live chickens. Um, she used to bring in, I think she had, I'm not sure what else she had, chickens, dogs, or I don't know. She brought in live things and, and had students, actually she used to make students take chicken feet home to draw. <laughs> so everyone got their own chicken foot. Um, we're gonna make our way back to the bone room back here, which is a room that I do not believe was original to this space. I'm not sure exactly what it was prior to uh, Miss Lawrence's being here, but if we're gonna head back in here. And it's a little messy because we're live and we're at, we're doing things. Uh, people, students have been coming in and, and working on things. I'm transplanting some plants and getting students some um, specimens ready to deliver to them. Uh, we have not real skeletons. These are all uh, replicas, but they, this is for anatomy classes. There are several bones um, and skeletons of animals through here. Most of everything we have is real. We have a few replicas, but generally everything is real. So this is for anatomical information or structural information, how things locomote, how joints function and articulate. Um, behind us here is the wall of skulls, mostly. We have a variety of different animals. We collect as many as we can. We purchase them, many are donated. Uh, and students use them again for all kinds of different things. They may need to study how teeth work. There's a wing back here you, that students could study how wings are structured and built, um, build something based on that for biomimicry or just simply because it's an interesting shape and they like it. These things mostly, I'd say 50% of the collection is, um, is allowed to be checked out like a library book. Most of everything is, is hands-on because it's a teaching collection which was a big thing of Miss Lawrence's. She was not a big fan of letting us take specimens home because as she wrote in her, in her notes, they usually break everything. And that's true, but gives me job security. <laughs> and it gives the students here job security. So everybody learns how to, for example, uh, glue back an antenna uh, or a foot that somebody's foot fell off. I put little tarantula legs back together. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. So, Betsy, when you mentioned delivering the specimens that are on the table behind you, are you putting those right through the mail room, or are people checking them out online? Are they going to a professor? Both professor and students can come in individually. Mm -hmm. Students can still come in. Uh, our hours are seriously limited at the moment. Um, but students can come in. This in particular was a faculty member, a freshman class for. Um, her, it's a 3D class, spatial dynamics, and she has them check out insects so that they can study insects and then recreate them in wire uh, with beautiful results most of the time, I have to say. So I'll be packing them up for her and she'll be picking them up. But students can still come in and search and do their own shopping while they can't rifle through. They can ask us to take things out for them. They can still check things out and check out as many things as they want at one time. It's not just limited to one item. There's no other place like this on the planet as far as we know. I'm sure several universities have their own natural history collection. However, to be able to actually go through and touch everything and then to be checking things out and taking them home is a luxury that most people will never have. So for us, this is the jewel in, in RISD's crown in many ways. Of course, I think so, because you know I'm prejudiced. I like the place. So um, I was just mentioning the animals. The animals are all living at my home right now, the live animals, but usually we have a little snake and a gecko, a tortoise. Uh, who else is there? Oh, the degus, some little rodents, lots of different insects. Again, for you can, they can just draw them. They can study them. A snake is great for studying locomotion. I'll figure that one out. Uh, and that's pretty much what happens in here. Thanks, Betsy. You are so welcome. So Betsy will join us for the Q&A portion after we've taken the rest of our report. So we're going to follow Jen next. Yeah, so um, Edna Lawrence, when she left in 1977, is that right? So she was here for 40 years. And when she left, she, she gave the piece of advice that it'd be wonderful to get a microscope that would allow students to look at all of this color and pattern and form and texture and structure at different scales. So you'll see how we responded to that and what it has grown into recently. 
bring it down to the end of the class. And do you have any animals in your basement? I do not. Um, and in fact, some of them that, that were remote have now returned. And I'll give you a picture of a couple of those. Um, but no, I think we have fish at one staff member's house, but Betsy, as the curator of the collection, she was taking care of them mm. anyway, so she kind of moved them in and her home. I think they have their own rooms. Awesome. So, not pretty <laughs> other rooms. lab and this is the answer to Edna being able to look at things at different scales and of course since 1977 it's only grown so we started off with some of these uh, stereo microscopes um, where we'll often have full classes in here in non-COVID times that will allow students to look at small specimens at magnifications up to 40 times so we'll use those scopes with tiny town so Tiny Town is kind of like an analog to the collection that you just saw upstairs, but with everything in their own individual little boxes so that they can easily be put under the microscope for viewing. And in this way, you know, Betsy mentioned biomimicry, for example, you can look at the tiny little structures that allow these creatures to do what they do and live how they live. And again, sometimes when you look at different magnifications, you see things that you wouldn't otherwise see. Um, so, for example, we have up on one of our screens right here, this is a sea urchin. Um, and this is one of the stereo microscopes. So this isn't at a very high magnification right now, but you can start to get a sense of, you know, what the different pores look like and even some textural differences, right? Like those knobs have this sort of like very different sort of shiny aspect to them as opposed to the rest of it. And those would be the knobs that the little spines articulate on as joints. So Jen, if I'm working and using one of these microscopes, can I email myself this picture? Or? Absolutely. So these are all equipped with both still and video capabilities. Okay. So you can actually put live organisms on there and watch how they move. Cool. Um, yeah. So that's at one end of the spectrum. Um, we also have light microscopes that allow us to see up to a thousand times magnification. Um, and we have uh, slides up against the far wall that students can access and put on here. And so this allows us to look at things like bacteria and some of the micro fungi. So we'll be able to look and see um, and get inspiration from even at that level of the natural world. Um, we have been very fortunate in that we have gotten National Science Foundation funding. Um, we are one of a consortium of eight institutions around the state and we're the only NSF funded EPSCOR facility that is an art and design school. And they're really interested in what we're coming up with in terms of what happens at the interesting intersection when you bring artists and designers together with scientists. Um, so all of this imaging is something novel for scientists to think about in terms of communicating, communicating how, um, what the species are that they're working on but also thinking about better ways of communicating um, more broadly to the public and even seeing details about the specimens that they're studying in ways that they couldn't in their lab. Um, Betsy mentioned that the upstairs collection is unmediated open access. And we have equipment here that um, basically is open to anyone in that consortium and all RISD students, the equipment that you wouldn't normally be able to get access to. So for example, at Brown University, you wouldn't be able to necessarily access a scanning electron microscope where you'd have to pay money, you'd have to have a research grant to access it. But here we happily train students. Um, so this is our scanning electron microscope here. Um, and you can see there's a variety of different things like this is the, the microstructures of a feather. Even though it says sponge, I'm pretty sure that's a feather. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so again, things that you wouldn't normally be able to like uh, see or intuit, you can see, you can get inspiration at different scales. Um, against the far wall over there, we have images that were taken with the scanning electron microscope. And I think it's really interesting that that one that looks like um, kind of like a sunrise with the E's on it, that is a sea urchin 
magnified up to uh, 10,000 times, I think. And so you really start to get a sense of what you thought, that knob that you thought was, you know, just a clear, smooth surface is actually quite porous. And that there's details in that form that you weren't aware of. Um, or this one, for example, this is a Corellia sulcata. It's a kind of single-celled photosynthesizing marine organism. But if you look closely, you can see that nature was doing arches as strong supporting structures and coming up with interesting joints to hold them together that long before humans came along and were able to figure these things out for themselves. Um, so right here we have my colleague, Georgia Rhodes. And she is our um, visualization and imaging research associate. And she's going to talk a little bit about a project that we're working on that brings some of the data that's being created by area scientists on Narragansett Bay um, into the art and design world, into what we can do in terms of visualizing that for them in novel ways. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Like Jen said, I'm Georgia. I'm a researcher here at the Nature Lab and also working on behalf of the consortium that she earlier mentioned, RICA. Uh, I have, we also, from macro to micro, so we also have a suite of GIS stations, so geographic information systems that is oftentimes where we're sort of starting out working with researchers because as visual artists and designers, a lot of the places what we want to start with is spatialization. So we want to put things in space in a way that we all understand and can use some of the information that's coming out of their labs. Um, and so I'm going to show you guys a project that we're currently working on when we go and visit the back room. But here is where we sort of started gathering our data from some of our partners and also from places like NOAA and the Rhode Island DEM and other places where they're sort of gathering data. So I'll take off these colors. These are sort of some biological data we were working with with another researcher down at URI. But so this is some LIDAR data we've compiled and it's in a boundary box for the area that we're studying. So Narragansett Bay, um, you can always put on a a map and sort of figure out where we are in the spot in space when we're sort of working with stuff. A lot of having GIS helps that you can constantly be flipping back and forth through data and also a map and really understanding where you are when you're working with in space. Um, but so out of that picture that I just showed you, um, this one out of LiDAR data, we've actually made a massive 3D mesh of Narragansett Bay and we're currently using uh, a CNC router to cut it out back here. We've transformed the nature lab prep room into a sort of current research space. So come in, sorry, it's tight corners. <laughs> so you'll need to watch out where you sort of are. Jen can maybe talk about storage afterwards if you want to. <laughs> it's an exciting part of the nature lab. Um, but I have some sort of 3D printers on projectors and other things that are covered up right now because we are working with the CNC and it's really dusty. Um, here is a sort of prototype, different prototypes of the model that we're working on. We ended up with some 3D print examples as well as our current CNC prototype. Wow. For, that includes both bathymetry and topography of Narragansett Bay and the surroundings. Georgia, will you back up a little bit? I only knew what one of those terms was. <laughs> sure, which term? I, topography, I was okay. familiar with. So topography is, is the land, you know, me, land of measurements in, that starts usually around zero sea level. And then bathymetry is, both, is the curves and the measurements of how deep the ocean, sur or not surface, ocean floor is ah, underneath. Cool. So together, it's total Oh, That sounds like a good tongue twister. It is. <laughs> um, and so not only do we use, start at those, sort of those big zoomed out levels to build things like maps, but we also really use GIS as a way to bring these things into animation programs and other things that artists and designers and maybe even just the public are more aware of using instead of things like computational programs in which we use supercomputers, um, you know, so we can really easily put things in things like any, most of the Adobe software programs. Um, and I can quickly play an animation for you. You might not be able to actually see it, but so we're using those same big 
ideas or you know ways in which we're organizing and spatializing data we can also move into this sort of 2d realm mm -hmm. as well and we're working on a project where we're currently projection mapping some of these 2d animations onto our 3d model mind is blown and that's that's behind you. <laughs> and it's a thing of beauty and the idea is that it's a way to engage the public mm. in understanding that the bay that we all live around and so it's going to be this big and so it's going to be a space that you can actually like visually explore the bay and the data will be presented you know moving through the bay as it would um the video you just saw was microplastics and where they start out in the bay and then where they're going to wind up in the bay so we're hoping that it's a it's a platform for both engaging the public so that they know more about their actions and what the the impacts that they're having on this beautiful water the ocean state um, that we call home, but also it's a place that scientists can then stand around and project each other's data and start to make linkages um, between what they're seeing so that they get a wholer picture um, of what is going on with the health of the day. So would you show just briefly the 3D scanning? Sure. And then put it by our maker space? Yeah. We already talked about the 3D scanning after. No. Skeleton so okay. area. area. <laughs> So this is, we just want to briefly show you this because this is a, one of the hottest things I think for um, RISD students, both when non-COVID times to be able to use this equipment, um, but we've also been able to make it available virtually for students and faculty. And this is our 3D scanner. So um, our 3D scanner is really very, very high resolution. And we've scanned things from the mummy at the museum um, to a human brain. We had researchers from Brown come down and use our equipment. And so the notion is that anything that we have in our collection or anything that we have 3D, you can make a 3D model out of. And so it becomes this virtual object that you can then embed in whatever kind of 3D software you want to use it for. And Georgia and our colleague Ben have done an amazing job of scanning a lot of the collection and putting it up online. We have a Sketchfab site that I'm sure Ben will put the link in the chat to. Um, we also have a site on Digital Commons that takes images from our other imaging equipment and puts them up online. So that all of this is still available to RISD students um, to access even if they can't come into the lab. And we do take requests. So if you know that there's something in the collection that you haven't seen on the Sketchfab or the Digital Commons site, you can request it and we'll scan it for you. Exactly what Jen said. Okay, this is normally how it works. I'm not going to turn this on because I didn't plug it in and because it's really bright and it would be very screen go crazy. Um, but so this is sort of our typical setup of how we would do something. It looks kind of like an iron and we just spin it around, take a bunch of measurements and then it goes over here into this program. This is actually a crow that Ben is working on, but you can really see just how incredibly detailed it is. I'll zoom into its little feet. You know, and he's even got, you know, missed out under here, so you, you don't have mesh where it isn't supposed to be. And, you know, like Jen was mentioning, and like upstairs where we talk about unmitigated access, all the scans on our Sketchfab site are totally free to download for anybody. Um, and they are downloaded by everybody. Like <laughs> tens of thousands. Yeah, and wow. so started it in May. Um, yeah. They are really, people are really excited about it. It's been a really great resource. We've gotten some people back being like, here's what I did with the scans, which is what we really love. So, you know, our scans are really one to one, really high resolution representations. And students, alumni, people across the world are taking them and just going going with what we gave them to make something completely new and different. That's particularly exciting. Oh, that's great. So I'm going to take you into our biodesign maker space, which is the last of our main spaces. Thank you so much, Georgia. So this is another space that was funded by the National Science Foundation. And the notion behind this space was to encourage students to both recognize the benefits of working in a nature rich space and to work with what we call the technologies of nature. So how do we as designers, as artists, work with nature for nature so that we can create a better future um, environmentally? So um, this actually was designed by RISD interior architecture students in the spring of 2018. And then we had a cohort of four graduate students and four undergraduate students 
um, from a variety of different disciplines that came in and, and built out the space. So these big cork modules that are in the back were actually um, uh, CNC'd in Portugal and shipped in, but all of the wood fabrication, even the metal welding underneath these tables, um, the fabrication of the whole countertop over there, um, the CNC routing of the table tops, um, all was done by RISD students over a 10 week period. And the notion behind this space is, is multifold. As I said, it's about encouraging students to, to work with nature. And part of that is really understanding the local ecosystem. So what's inlaid in the tops of these tables is uh, different rivers from the Narragansett Bay watershed. So how much more mindful can you get than sort of working on the bay as you're doing what you're doing? Um, these handmade paper shades of the lights above you actually have inclusions of a um, invasive species called Phragmites. And the notion behind that was how can we get things that are abundant in our environment that shouldn't be there if we could create some way of making with them that would take them out of the environment and give the native species a hand. Um, and normally we go out collecting with RISD students and we get vertebrate and invertebrate life from the bay. So those 250 gallon tanks are usually filled with salt water and then also crabs and snails and sea urchins and anemones and fish that are part of the local Narragansett Bay ecosystem. Again, it's a way of daylighting, if you will, all of these species that we are sharing our world with um, in a way that you wouldn't, no matter how many times you went back and forth across the river, across the canal, you might never know what was down below. The other thing that we tried to do in this space was design it according to biophilic design principles. So this is actually an evidence-based design that says people tend to have better immune function. They tend to have better cognitive performance. Um, they tend to be less stressed in environments that have certain um, patterns and presences of nature. So the presence of moving water, um, the presence of lush greenery, like you can see in the, in the green wall that we have behind us. Um, all of these things, the biomorphic shape of the tables, the biomorphic shape of the lights, this sort of notion that the lights serve as a canopy the same way in a forest you would see light coming down diffused and filtered through the treetops. All of this is, is inspired to give you that kind of feeling that you're in this space. And we actually taught um, high school students a biodesign curriculum in this space. Um, and that went really well and it sort of proved the, this notion that the space itself can lead to interesting and novel outcomes. Um, so in terms of what I mentioned before about working with the technologies of nature, the way that we do that is multifold. So um, we can take nature as direct inspiration uh, this notion that nature has been doing research and development for 3.8 billion years. And so they've solved a lot of design problems. Um, so we can look to the collection, we can use our imaging equipment to sort of gain deeper insight into how these organisms are solving these design problems and how we might translate that into our own designs. But then we also think about the materiality that nature makes out of, right? Like nature doesn't do heat, beat, and treat. Everything that they do is at ambient temperature and pressure and using water as a solvent. And if we could do that, we could solve a lot of our pollution problems. So I put out some samples of some biomaterials. Um, this is a really hot topic for a lot of risky students. And the notion is really how can you create things that only last as long as they need to last. A lot of our pollution problems come with the fact that we create things like plastics that will last for thousands of years and all we need them is as a takeout container to last until we eat or consume whatever is inside. So this notion is basically we're working with the natural world to create things. So for example, this is kombucha leather. So if any of you like kombucha, this is made from the symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast the bacteria actually lay down this cellulose that you can then harvest. And there are many designers working with this as a, as a material. Um, this is the work of an ID graduate student, Tarek El Zawawi, where he used a starch-based bioplastic and he embedded eggshell waste from um, area um, restaurants to make this really leather-like fabric. So he was able to create um, 
these are just a couple of the yeah these are just a couple of the samples that he let us have he also has a big handbag that he made out of it and these are a couple of years old now and they're still very very durable mm. um textile students in particular are very interested so this is the work of Rhea Milani she was a senior in textiles a couple of years ago and so she used it as she used a um a seaweed auger based bioplastic to work with some of the more traditional textiles and turn them into a novel form. Um, and this is also one of her explorations using some traditional textile dyes, but also um, seashells that she ground up to put into the plastic. So we, we try to keep a hold of some of the research that's been done by RISD students themselves. Um, that's mushroom mycelium. It's, this weighs nothing. I had totally the opposite expectation when I picked it up. Yeah, so most of the time, it reads like cement, kind of, exactly. right? Exactly. But it's actually a foam. And what it is is you use mushrooms that are decomposers, and you basically, you feed them, and you encourage them to make this matrix around, this is a hemp herd um, construction. So, and they will grow in whatever shape you want them to. So if you turn around, and um, you can see that, um, People sort of took this to the extreme and made a chair out of mushroom mycelium. So that was actually done by a company called Ecobated, and they um, presented it at our biodesign show that we had a couple of years ago, and they were kind enough to let us have um, the work that they had done. But so just proof of concept, you know, when you're done with this chair, you don't like it anymore, you, you know, the cat tore into it, you want to dispose of it, you can just send it back to um, a compost pile. Oh, wow. And it will decompose. So in terms of that, this is something else that Ecobative is doing. This is their new material called Mycoplex. So it's pure mycelium, nothing held in between it. So it's this very flexible, kind of suede-like feeling material. Oh, wow. It's hard to describe what it feels like, but suede is kind of close, yeah. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's spongy. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, like a dry omelet, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we try to collect as much as possible, like innovative materials from other designers um, outside of RISD as well. So this is the work of um, an artist and designer named Diana Scher, and she is a um, an apparel designer. But she noticed the way that roots were growing when you get a root-bound plant, and the way that roots will grow around the side and they'll sort of coalesce there. And she thought, I wonder if I can train them to create patterns. And so this is actually the roots of oat grass. So you could, you could actually eat the grass, and then you could you could make your fabric at the huh. same time. I love that it's not just about innovating the chair or the wallet or the keychain, but more also about thinking about reinventing what that material is and what happens to it in the next iteration. It's such a great resource, and especially you know we, in our culture we have a lot of um, luxury apparel that gets created for one event, right? And then what happens to it? Maybe it winds up in the Smithsonian if you're someone famous, but <laughs> But chances are it winds up in landfills, right? So what would it be to be able to compost that? Um, the next level of designing with nature in mind is really about systems and thinking about much in the way that this, you think about how your materials are going to be um, going into a biological cycle where something is going to break them down and use them again. They're not gonna wind up in a landfill. We think about how nature does cycles naturally and how we can, we can work with that. So we have a couple of aquaponic systems here. Um, usually there's three, again, because of COVID things are in a slight state of disrepair. But the notion is, you know, there's plumbing in between these two things. And the notion is you can have fish, and you feed the fish, the waste from the fish gets mediated by bacteria and turned into nutrients for plants. And by thinking along this way, you can think of a couple of things, like the plants are cleaning the water, which is awesome. Um, but you can start talking about creating food in food deserts. So if you had an edible fish in a tank like this, like something like tilapia and perch, clearly it would need to be much larger. And then you had your garden um, that was fed soilless, like a, like a hydroponic system. You could, in fact, in an urban environment like we're in right now, grow your food, both your protein sources and your vegetable sources. So this is another system. I told you we brought some of the, the creatures back in for this little goldfish here. There's actually um, 
axolotls in there, they must be hiding. Uh, so they're providing the base food for the plants that are growing up above, and we have to rebuild that system once we're for sure back on campus full time. Um, and we actually taught a class, I taught a class with um, the industrial design department where students were understanding the concepts behind creating an aquaponics system, creating a living machine, if you will, and how they could adapt that for different environments and for different purposes, both to increase the biophilic nature of the space, as well as to start to solve some of the social and environmental problems that we're having. So that's the notion behind the space. We still teach bio design here at RISD, and it would typically be happening in this classroom. Unfortunately, with COVID, um, it's not happening, but we will get back there again. Great. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm glad to be able to tour everybody through the space, even virtually, and look forward to the time when you can come in. Great. So um, I hope everyone sticks around. We're going to have a Q&A. Uh, Betsy, Georgia. Ben and Jen are going to join us. So um, go ahead and type your questions into the chat and we'll start answering them in just a moment as we get to our safe spaces for that Q&A portion. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the tour. Can everyone hear me okay? I just have this uh, terrible phobia that no one will hear me over Zoom. Okay. So while uh, Jen moves back to her computer, I think that we have Betsy with us and Ben, who you didn't meet on the tour, but whose office I'm in. So let's see. We'll have them turn on their cameras and their microphones. Okay, let's see, I think there's Ben. All right, so Hello. let's see. Uh, oh, sorry, can you hear me still? Yep. All right, so, we, oh great, hi Ben. Hey, how's can it you going? introduce yourself since you weren't on the tour with us? Sure, I'm Benedict or Ben Gagliardi. I'm the Nature Lab biologist now, uh, or formerly the Nature Lab lab coordinator for imaging and aquatics. So I oversee the microscopy lab and the uh, the fish tanks when they're full. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much for joining us, Ben. My I have a few questions already. So I'm going to start. Uh, let's see. How do students access the 3D printer? Do you have to be in a certain class or do you get on a waiting list, etc.? <laughs> I, I could take that one. So there might be some slight misconstruing of 3D technologies. We don't actually have a 3D printer here. But we do. Oh, we do? We do, but that George is working with for the stat grant, oh, but it's oh, not oh. available for students, unfortunately. It, it's so new that it doesn't even register as a piece of equipment that we have to me. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it's not okay. available to use at this point. Well, hopefully one day in the future. And tomorrow, if you're able to join us, we're going to visit CoWorks where there are many 3D printers. If I could, uh, let's, oh, yeah. I could digress from that slightly and just say, um, Jen mentioned that uh, with our 3D uh, scan library, you could suggest things to scan. So we scan all nature related things, but uh, if there's something missing from our online resources, um, you can put in a suggestion of, or a request for something to scan and we have a form right on the first page of our website that I'll pop into the, the, uh, the chat right now. Great, thanks Ben. Okay, another question. Are there any grad studies available in biomorphic design? Are there grad studies in biomorphic design? So um, we, 
we work with students individually. I don't know that there are any classes per se in biomorphic design. Um, we've had a number of graduate classes that are being offered um, like interspecies collaboration, biomimicry, biodesign, that haven't necessarily focused just on the biomorphic nature of them. Um, like biomimicry usually goes more into the materials and systems too, but we are here to support all grad students. So if you wanted to do an ISP or you, um, you know, have another class that you want to focus your deliverables for that class using biomorphic design, we will be here to assist you. Okay, great. Also, Jen, I've just noticed you have the best Zoom backdrop probably of all time now <laughs> with the, the green wall. Uh, so another question, can you tell us which classes utilize the nature lab as a classroom? So this, I feel like everyone can answer with the different spaces. Betsy, you want to take it for the upstairs space? Yeah. Um, essentially, um, when things are normal, freshmen are in here quite a bit. Uh, basically, I'd say for drawing projects, for 3D projects, for their 2D design projects, depends on the faculty member. Uh, if the pe faculty member wants them to come in here, sometimes they would come in as an entire class, which would mean all 20 students would come in. And the rest of the time, once you get, actually, once you get out of freshman year, you're so involved in your major that it's hard to come back in to find time. But students, so I hire students, mostly undergrads. So that's one way to get back in here. But the other way is if you have a project or you have some research or something that, something specific that you need to study, whether it be downstairs in the science, more science aspect, or up here in the older, um, more traditional nature lab aspect. So I think I'd said earlier, it's like about 30% um, of the student, of the people that use the nature lab are freshmen. Another 30% would be from the continuing education programs, which normally are very, very robust, but are kind of not so much right now. And then the rest of RISD as a whole, including graduate studies, other people come in here. Just this morning, an ID student was in here, an industrial design student was in here studying the structure of cacti. Uh, so you just, uh, you just don't know what they're gonna be doing in here, but that's pretty much, it's, it runs the gamut, but primarily I'd say freshmen are in here a lot. Ben, you wanna talk about the imaging lab? Sure. Downstairs, like Betsy said, we regularly get um, first year students, foundation studies classes like spatial design and, and 2D drawing and things like that. Whole classes will come in to sit with the microscopes and look at specimens from the tiny town collection and make a series of drawings where they really focus on one small feature of, of a specimen and really kind of capture that out of context at a totally different uh, scale of perception. Um, and then regularly we'll have other classes from that run the gamut of, of uh, courses and, and departments at RISD. So um, glass, there's a glass class coming in that likes to look at samples in the scanning electron microscope. Um, there's sculpture classes that use our 3D scanner a lot. Um, really, really everything. I mean, we've had a, a really interesting uh, run of textiles groups come in to look at different fibers under the microscopes and explore um, how structural color works and, and the possibility of, of scaling that up. Uh, uh, really, it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenally wide range of classes that, that gravitate toward here to, to come as a group. And also individuals just come with questions about, uh, can I raise moss on this? Can I can I look at this in the scanning electron microscope? Uh, any type of research project, we're kind of the go-to science uh, question answerers. <laughs> we also have um, science classes from the liberal arts curriculum that take place here as well. So like an entomology okay. class, um, uh, global disasters, uh, trying to think of all the ones. So, so they make use of the space and the equipment. Um, we didn't get into the fact that we have quite a bit of field equipment too that allows um, either the Nature Lab staff on different research projects or um, groups of classes to go out and really do some scientific surveying um, and collecting from the natural world. 
I, I totally forgot about the liberal arts classes and so many others. There's also a class, uh, uh, a winter session class called Botany in the Kitchen that Hope Leeson teaches and we have to suffer through because it smells so good in there and they're cooking things. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for answering those questions from all the different spaces. So we've got a question about how students are using the collection more this year with COVID. So I know we've talked a little bit about 3D scanning and checkouts, but are there other ways that you're seeing the collection being utilized? I can, I can take that. Uh, um, it, it's pretty, I don't think COVID has made that much of a difference on what they're choosing to use, uh, except that I think it's easier for people and maybe less scary for people to use the online options that Ben and Georgia have offered, the 3D scans <clears throat> and the, um, the digital commons imagery. People can still, they're still coming in here to work on, I think I'd mentioned the insect project. There's another one, a 2D class where they pick out patterning from different specimens. There are students who come in I, there's a freshman uh, who's been coming in almost every night that he can that he's free just to sit and draw because he just likes the place. I and mean, there are people we used to just get people coming in here to eat lunch because it's just such a it's such a nice space. It's different. It's it feels like you're walking into a little time warp when you come in here. So we're, we're really like a Victorian um, cabinet of curiosities, and the more you dig, the more you find. I've been here for 20 years, 21 years, and every now and then something comes up that I haven't seen before and I, I know there are about 80,000 specimens in the collection. Some of them I know personally. Most of them I know pretty well, but every now and then something pops up. So people just come to explore too. I'd say, so I think that the way that the pandemic has affected us most is that our hours are so cut back uh, and so there's less availability, so there's less flexibility on the students part to be able to come in. The pandemic hasn't done us any favors in many ways, but uh, they're still coming in. They're still coming in and frankly, they're just using it the same way from, from my point of view. Oh. Betsy, we just got a question about the schedule. So someone is wondering if uh, rooms are accessible on the weekends, particularly the freshmen. Uh, we had to close on Saturday because we just don't have enough human beings to be here. And on Sundays, we're open from 1 till 6 p.m. Uh, in the mornings, we're, on weekdays, we're open from noon, from 9 a.m. till noon, and then again from 4 to 8. And we planned those hours based on the, what the freshman schedules were really. trying, Assuming that when they're out of class at about 4 or 5 in the afternoon, they may want to come in here and do some work or have an assignment they need to work on, maybe come in after dinner for a couple of hours. The problem is we don't have enough staff members to go around and we have certain restrictions on how long we're supposed to be here. So everything got really cut back. But absolutely, if you, um, if you know of a freshman who hasn't been in here yet, they're not, they're not doing themselves a service by staying away. <laughs> it's such an important part of freshman year. It's, it makes me sad that, uh, that COVID is affecting that so much because this really, this really is a critical part of RISD's experience and I encourage people to come in here as much as they can. And just to add- If I get a full night's sleep, I might look like a freshman so I can sneak back in. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> just put charcoal all over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> just to add a detail to that, not, not to confuse, but the microscopy lab downstairs uh, is slightly different hours, same morning hours, but we're open Monday to Friday uh, uh, two to six, and then we're, we're not actually open on the weekends down there. But I do have a microscope upstairs, so if someone wanted to use just your basic stereoscope like you'd use in a biology class that magnifies 40 times, I, I have one of those up here, and I have the ability to take some photos with another handheld type of microscope. It's not, the resolution isn't quite as fancy, and you don't have all the fancy schmancy stuff up here that you have downstairs. This is sort of the throwback in time up here. But there, um, there is uh, the ability to take a look at something in a, in a microscope up here. I think it's oh, an important- great. And Sorry. I just wanted to note that, you know, we sort of went over the facility and the holdings and the capacity for things to do here. But like my training is as a biologist and marine scientist and Ben is an entomologist. So we have scientists on staff that can help you dive into whatever your project is as, as far as you wanna go in the science. 
Um, if we don't know it, we'll find somebody who does know it. And so that's always available to you, whether or not you're able to come in is to, you know, use us as a, a science resource for however it might apply to your work. Great, thank you. So Betsy, this one I think is also for you and you touched on it a little bit in our tour. Um, our nature lab is so unique and impressive. Do any other art schools have anything close to what the RISD nature lab offers? <laughs> no. no, 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 no. A couple of schools actually, was it the new school in New York City, I think came up here uh, a few years ago. And, was it? And they, and they tried to, um, they were interested in doing it, and there's, a, I think, a something in Arizona, I forgot, is it Tempe? Arizona, Arizona State University, which has a biomimicry program, just opened something called Nature Maker. They actually came and toured and tried to figure out how we do what we do. Um, so they have a small, um, they have a small holding and some microscopes. So they've tried, but they have not succeeded necessarily in, in giving, first of all, we have the advantage of having been here in this space specifically since 1937, and of Edna Lawrence having collected prior to that. So we have this huge collection, um, and we also give students the opportunity to handle it, like I said, and check things out. So they can go to any natural history museum, and any museum person with half a mind is going to go nuts if they let people touch all their specimens. And that is just anathema to what a museum is about. Never touch anything. You just look through the windows. So. Uh, that's, I'm sure there are plenty of those, but to actually handle things and then to check them out, no, we are it. Oh, that's great. All right, so folks, we're gonna stay up for a minute or two if um, other people have questions. And while those last questions come in, I wanted to share a story that I first heard about RISD because Martha Stewart brought her TV show to the Nature Lab when I was in third grade. Um, and I had to ask my mom about this to make sure I hadn't saved it. Oh, here's a question. Thank goodness. I don't have to tell you any more about my Martha Stewart. Um, do you take donations of specimens? That's a great question. Yeah, they should contact me uh, on, our, on our website's contact page. They would contact me through my RISD email address. Uh, I would let them know, number one, if it's something that we can use. Number two, if uh, we can take it. And um, if they need a tax deduction, I can help them figure out how to do that too. So yeah, um, you know, private universities tend to not have a ton of money in their budgets and um, donations are welcome. I mean, if someone came in and said, I have 15 bobcat skulls, I'd have to think twice about it because we have a lot of bobcat skulls already and I don't have the space for them necessarily, but I might find another reason to use them. So. I, I, I love hearing from people. Uh, I just had a huge collection of skulls from someone who just passed away. His, his widow decided to donate to us and I got all kinds of great things. So um, it's like Christmas every day when somebody donates, it's really great. Great. Well, I think we'll start to wrap up. Uh, Jen, Ben, Betsy, is there anything else that you wanna leave us with? I know that you've posted a lot of links for us in the chat uh, so we can learn more about the Nature Lab, but let us know if there's anything else we should keep in mind um, about the space. Yeah, just I just want to remind everyone that we are a resource for the whole campus. So um, whether or not you are in a class that's in this space or whether or not you're a freshman um, and actually like coming to classes here, we are here for you. And one of the saddest things to me is when a student comes through on the tour for the parents during graduation time and they're like, oh my gosh, this was here? I had no idea. Like, don't let that happen to you and don't let that happen to your student <laughs> um, if you're a, a, a parent of one of the RISD students. So I would encourage everybody to come in here. It really sets students' work apart, I think, too, when they're presenting their portfolios or they're in interviews and they can show that they've used a scanning electron microscope or you know, 3D scanning of a natural history collection. Um, the fact that we have this available and no other school does is then also going to make your work um, stand out. Also, Zoom doesn't do it justice. There's, <laughs> it doesn't. There's uh, a feeling, when I first walked in here, I just went, wow, I just want to live in here because it, it just has a, in spite of the fact that there are a lot of things in here who are no longer living, um, it's, it, there's something magical and transformative about it. And I volunteered here for off and on for 12 years. 
I mean, I must like it a lot if I just came in here for free, right? So um, I think I think if you do get the chance and if things change around so that you can come in and visit, absolutely come and stop by. Yeah, Betsy, no, exactly. you need to finish your story. Yeah, I want. I was here oh. when when, um, when Martha Stewart came in, so I'm very curious to hear what you said. <laughs> Sorry, Ben, we are cutting you off for more Martha Stewart, oh, which someone else is asking in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> it was basically just that my mom used to watch the TV show all the time. You know, she'd have a cooking segment and, you know, they'd go somewhere and there was a craft segment. And I was in third grade and she walked into the nature lab and I just thought, this is the most amazing place. There are all of these specimens, people are drawing, people are touching things. And I, you know, just thought, okay, I really, this seems accessible in this Martha Stewart moment, I really want to investigate more. And when it came down to it, I applied to two schools and luckily RISD was one of them. And um, I'm so happy to be in the basement of the Nature Lab today, many years later. Well, Martha Stewart had, uh, when she had her magazine and her TV show, she used a lot of graphic design students uh, from RISD to design her magazine and also to uh, designed the layout for the for pro product layout or whatever promotional layout she did on her show in terms of color and the way the show looked. A lot of that was done by RISD students. So she, her students or the people that worked for her decided to come up here on a visit. And she was wearing some taxidermy, some bobcat that didn't have any skin or it was just skin and she was, you know, posing and stuff. It was, she was actually very gracious and very nice. And she, she communicated back and forth with a couple of students, too. Wow. Thank you, Betsy. I'm going to think about that for the rest of the day. <laughs> um, any, so I think we've kind of hit our time. It's almost one. I just want to say thank you so much to Ben and Georgia, Betsy and Jen for joining us, and of course to all of you. So institutional engagement will post this up online next week. So if you found this so riveting that you want to share it, you'll be able to see it again. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Lois. Bye. Yeah, see you soon. Bye. Good job, Lois.